Uh, it's good to see you guys. It's good to know that Thanksgiving's coming off. You may get a couple of days this week when you're able to uh, stay home, relax, invite relatives over, go shopping on Black Friday, uh, all kinds of things that you're able to do this time. And so we want to talk a little bit about humble thanks and about what that really kind of means. I find a number of times that we pull passages out of the Bible that are um, they're great stories in themselves. And that's always the challenge with the sermon is, well, this is a great passage, so I'll just use this because this is all I've got time for. And, but the next part really connects to it, and the next part really connects to it. And by the time you get three or four of those together, you say, well, that changes the meaning entirely, so get comfortable, we're going to be here. No, that's really not the case. But I mean, we want to look at this whole passage and the idea of what thankfulness is about. Yesterday, we had the turkey pantry here. We have done this for a number of years, and so I wanted to give you guys a little bit of view of what happened. This was all done outside. Some people came. They were able to pick up turkeys and a whole bag of groceries just because of you guys and because of all the things that you've done. And so it was really great being able to be there and, and watch how people would come and how they're able to get some, some of these uh, things. And they're all very thankful at all of this. And so thank you guys for being able to share with so many other people and being able to make that possible. So when we start to look at thankfulness, I mean, we've had it before, right? Why did we ever lose it? What happened to it? Did it just go away? And maybe we need to look at some of the things that go on with that. Um, how long have you had relationships with other people? Because sometimes our thankfulness comes because there are people that we know and people that we care about, and people that we love. And sometimes our thankfulness is challenged by the people that we know, and the people we care about, and the people that we love. And so this being Thanksgiving week, a lot of times there are family get-togethers that are planned, maybe not so much right now, but uh, where all the relatives come over. All the people from the past that we've known for years, and that we've had good relationships with or had struggles with, and sometimes it's difficult for us to try to figure out exactly how all that works. And so as we look at this today, I hope this is going to be a time of thanks, but it can also be a time of stress because when people come over, you remember everything from the past, and hopefully it's all something that's good. But I want to look at this passage in Luke 17. Let's just start at the first part of this. He says, temptations are going to come. I mean, they're going to come. Don't let them come through you. Because if they come through you, then he's like saying, you're an accessory. And it's not taking away their sin or getting in on their sin, but it's your own sin. And so he says, I don't want you to be the one that causes people to sin. And I don't know if you've ever done that or had that or felt like there's other people who have influenced you and you wouldn't have done those things unless somebody pushed you into it. Unless there was a situation where, you know, you didn't feel like you had a choice. Has somebody ever set you up or put you in a place where you had to lie? And you just felt like, well, I... I don't want to hurt people. I don't know what to say here. And so uh, we say something that's kind of almost true. Or maybe we've made someone intentionally jealous or envious of some of the things we have because we showed them off a lot. Or maybe we've been partners in some of the things that people wanted to do that really weren't quite good for each other and had some spiritual consequences. We see a lot of people around today where they're involved in a sexual relationship outside of marriage. One of them brought the other one in. 
And it's always easier the second time, and it's always easier the next time after that. But somebody started that. And hopefully at the beginning of that, you thought, well, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to sin. I don't want to go against God. And so we get pulled in. Or you made me mad. You ever had somebody say that to you? You ever said that to somebody? You made me mad. Well, that's really not the case. It's you chose to get mad, but they provided enough of the situation to where, yeah, that was your choice. And so we do share in this somewhat. And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to share in those things. I'm not suggesting we take responsibility for their sin. Their sin is their sin. But sometimes we can make the situation difficult enough where they're going to do this and then we share in it. It's like when you drive the getaway car, you can't say, I had no part in it. You're an accomplice. You have a part in it. He says the punishment, it will be worse than if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Well, that does sound like a bad punishment, doesn't it? I mean, drowning is kind of bad and millstones are kind of heavy. So I thought I'd give you a look. Here is a millstone ready for the necklace. That's ah, a big stone. Uh, you're not going to swim very far with that around your neck. He says, that's what sin looks like. It is that big of a burden as if you're trying to swim with that around your neck. He says, that's kind of the punishment. It, our influence can lead people. It can lead them to something good. It can lead them to something bad. And when it leads to something bad, it can mess with our thankfulness. And we are not able to be thankful like we could before. And so I think it's important to realize that and understand that. And then he says, I want you to pay attention to yourselves. Be aware of your own sin. Be careful. Watch what you do. In the Corinthian letter, Paul tells him, be careful when you think you stand because that's the time when you're going to fall. And just about the time when we decided we've got it all together, together and we'll never again, then we find that, nope, it's... Somehow we got caught again. And so he says, pay attention to yourselves. And then he comes to the next section. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Well, we all sin. How much rebuking can you take? If every single little thing you ever did or thought that is a sin or wrong somebody comes up and starts in on you. Is that going to be an easy way? Does that help you be more of a Christian? Does that help you deal with the sin? Okay. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, he's talking about a sin. He's not talking about the fact that I don't like the way you did that. I don't like the style. I don't like the the method. It's that you did something wrong, and so it is definitely wrong. It's definitely a sin. It's definitely when the Bible calls a sin. It's, it's not something that's just a matter of, well, I don't like the way you did that. And so it's not confrontation on that. If your brother, it seems to me what he's saying is caught with a sin, then he may need some help where we could be in a place where we could help him with that. And it may be that he doesn't know about it yet, but he needs someone else to help him to see and to realize where he is. Help is because someone needs to say something. It needs to be clear. It needs to be with love. Rebuke does not need to turn into a shouting match or an accusation and guilt it means there's a relationship where you're able to talk to someone about sin in your life and sin in their life. Please do not think this is a one-way street. If you're not willing to talk about yours, 
then I'm not sure you're really in a place to talk about theirs. And so this needs to be where you have this relationship good enough where you're able to discuss things like this. And of course, then they're going to know yours, and it makes it much easier then to be able to talk about these things, and so you can get past all these things and clear this up. Certainly, this does not mean you tell everyone else about their sin, or you let them know to pray about it, or you get suggestions from somebody to ask them, well, should I talk to them about, you know, what they did? And no, none of that. This is where you would talk to them about their sin. Realize also there are other things that are involved with this. As you look at Galatians chapter 6, if someone is caught in a sin, which is very parallel to what Jesus is talking about here, you should restore that person, but you who live by the Spirit or you who are spiritual should restore that person. Now, that's not everybody. Not everybody's able to do this. And so a person who doesn't have this understanding and isn't able to do this in such a way where it brings people back and brings them back to God, take a break. Get to the point where you're able to do that before that ever happens. And so you're really not in the place to be able to do that yet. Because it does take a certain development in people to be able to approach them on this level. And so that's what he's trying to describe here. We're all sinners, but maybe we can help each other out. Because sometimes we don't see how we are. We just see how everybody else is, all the things they do. But we don't see what we do, because what we do is minor, right? But everybody else's sin, well, that's a big thing. He says, and when he repents, forgive, no matter how many times. And when he sins against you and repents, and the suggestion is seven times a day. Well, seven times a day, if you got to work, that's... Yeah, that's every hour of the day that you were at work. And so every single hour he's going to come back having done something wrong again and ask you for forgiveness. Well, by the end of the day, that's going to get difficult, isn't it? But that's what he says here is I want you to be able to be on this kind of relationship level with them where we are able to say, yeah, I understand you're repenting and you're forgiven from anything I could do. We forgive. Are they waiting for that? Are they hoping for that? Somehow God lets us have a place in this. Certainly God is going to forgive as well, but it, it kind of helps if we can say, yeah, forgiveness is there. And we're able to help in that part. And so do be careful how you rebuke. Do it so that they're able to repent because that's the real, the real purpose for it. It's not to produce shame and punishment so that they won't do it again because they'll feel bad enough. That's really not the purpose. We need to be clear, we need to be gentle, we need to use words that don't drive people further away. We need to help bridge the gap so that they're able to repent because we'll probably do one or the other. And we just need to be there for each other so that when we mess up, we're able to say, I, I messed up. And you know what, that clears up so much more. And if you start Thanksgiving with that, let's all say where we messed up. Would it go better? Uh, maybe family's the last place where we're able to get to that stage. Well, what does this have to do with being thankful? It's kind of the elephant in the room. You know that parable when nobody talks about it? It's like nobody sees it, but it's right there. and We're all just ignoring it. But we all already know. It's time to not let him hide in the middle of the room. It's time to say something about it and do it in a way that's going to bring about a resolution. It's hard to be thankful when you're dealing with sin. 
whether it's somebody else's or whether it's your own. It is just hard to be thankful. And if you're not feeling thankful this year, it could be that's the issue. It could be there's something with that. And especially as you get together and have people together and times are pressed and you're trying to shop and trying to get where you need to get and they're out of toilet paper again and you still have to wear a mask and there's all of this stuff going on and it just it just is frustrating, isn't it? And sometimes it's even just hard to be nice. Well, the disciples hear all of this talk about forgiveness and about, you know, talking to people about sin and all of these other things. And here's the response that they have in the next couple of verses. It says, they said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. That's a strange answer. It's kind of a strange question and kind of a strange response. Can you increase our faith? Sure, Jesus, can't you just give me where I'm able to do this better? where I'm able to do this forgiveness better, where I'm able to talk about myself better or talk about my failure better, that we're able to do this in a better way. And he says, you know what? If you had faith like a mustard seed, you could do anything. Mulberry trees into the ocean. Well, that's pretty impressive. Mustard seed, as you know, is very, very small. It grows bigger, it gets bigger, it's not a huge tree, uh, but it does get bigger, and so is he talking about the fact that if you had any faith at all, if you had the tiniest bit of mustard seed faith, and certainly some version seems to suggest that, if you had it as small as a mustard seed, but actually it says if you had faith like a mustard seed, it's talking about the fact that this is small and grows bigger. And I think there's more into that kind of a meaning, the fact that our faith is at this point, but it is a faith that grows bigger to meet any situation where we're going to get into. It grows bigger like the mustard seed. And then we could take mulberry trees, which are a lot bigger than mustard seed plants, and we can throw them into the ocean. And so faith starts from a very small beginning and grows mightily into a huge tree. There's the bottom part of a mulberry tree, also known as a sycamore tree. And so those have very, very deep roots. They spread out everywhere. They go in every direction. But what an odd response that now he begins talking about trees when we've been talking about forgiveness and we're talking about people who sin and now he wants to increase faith and he's talking about gardening. No, I don't think he is at all. Why would we want to uproot mulberry trees? Well, the mulberry isn't the problem. It's those stubborn sins in our life. When you look at this picture, what if that's what your sin looked like? And you're trying to take that out. Or you're trying to help somebody else take that much sin out of their life. And you're the two kids standing right there. That's who you are, and you're trying to figure out how in the world do we dig this out? How in the world can we ever get rid of this? Because uprooting that mulberry tree is the most difficult thing, and sin gets so tangled up, and we get it so deep-rooted into our life, it's hard to ever think we could get out. But we could be the one. We could be the one, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, that is able to uproot this mulberry tree, that is able to do this, because what Jesus did is so powerful for us. And that's what he's trying to describe in all of this. His next story, statement from this, 
is also another kind of odd transition because here he get, begins to talk a little bit more about what happens and what's expected. And so I think the first thankfulness killer could be sin. And here's the second one. He says, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? That would be great. When you get home from work, your wife says, just go sit down and relax, right? I know, a lot of us have that. Isn't that wonderful? Do you appreciate how difficult that is? Because Jesus isn't going to say that to you. I'm like, what? I was hoping Jesus was nicer than my wife. Uh, no, probably not. He says, no, there is something that is expected of you as a servant. And there's a lot expected of you as a servant. And Jesus tells him, here's the second thing that kills thankfulness. It's when we think we deserve better. After all, we're tired. We don't want to have to do this. We don't think this ought to be happening to us. Everybody else gets a better deal than us. I don't know why that is, but here we are, and we have to deal with all this. It's not fair, and we think we deserve something better. And we are not going to be thankful at that point. Kind of ruined it for us? No, no. We chose to let it ruin. Because the truth is, we are the servants of the Most High God. That's all we are. And yeah, it might be difficult if you're plowing. That's a pretty dirty job, isn't it? And you've got a plow and you've got an old mule and you're trying to dig through the ground and then you get in and the master's just been sitting in the house all day and it's like, well, no, you come in and you get my dinner ready first. and You can eat after that. Do we even get to that concept of God? Or do we say, no, God's nicer to us. He would never let us do that. Do you realize you've got a God who came and died on a cross for you? I mean, do we not get the concept of how much God has done for us and the way in which all of this happens? And we think about our unworthy servant place, and it is our place that we should do, and we think about the guy with all of those tangled roots of sin in his life, and maybe it looks a little bit better, and we think about the guy who deserves the millstone and to be thrown into the sea, and suddenly fixing dinner isn't really that bad. Somehow that seems like a whole lot better thing than all of that giant root system in our life or the millstone and trying to live with that. So why is this story here? I think it's here because we think we deserve better. And we seldom recognize that we are to do what Jesus asks and we are to do all that Jesus asks and we are to complete all of this and we look at everybody else who does not have to do it and we get a little frustrated. Other people don't have to do it. They can go fishing. They don't have to do this work. They don't have to finish everything. They get to do whatever they want and they don't worry about sin and after all, they can just go off and do anything that they want. And the only way to be thankful is to realize we have a greater master than they do. Our master forgives sin completely. Theirs only redefines it and says, well, it's an illness. Well, it's a condition. Well, it's an alternative lifestyle. Well, it's an alternative social behavior but it never gets rid of it, and all of those roots are still there in your life. Our Master gives the Holy Spirit. 
somebody who's inside of you to help you with the struggles that you have. Their master just says, well, do the best you can. Our master loves us enough to die for us, die on a cross. Their master doesn't at all, doesn't really care. Our master answers prayers, and they just burn incense. We have a better master. We're better servants because we have a better master. And there's something to be thankful for in having a master who's able to rid us of sin, and who's able to take away millstones, who's able to give us this great thing by the power of God. And God is so amazing. And he gives us this promise that if you're faithful in little, you're going to be faithful in much. And so we're willing to say, okay, then I'll be the servant. Because you're watching what happens in the little. And when you do that, you're going to see that I'm faithful in the much. Because I'd lot rather you look at what's little and all I have to do is this little thing. And you're going to think I'll be faithful in the much. I don't even have to do the big much because you already know I'm going to be there because I take care of all the little. And it's one of those amazing things that God is able to do with us. And then one more story that he gives us in this is the one about thankfulness. He says, on the way to Jerusalem, Luke 11, or 17, 11, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. And when they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was cleansed, he had that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And I don't think we need to read this as he's ridiculing the foreigner or not appreciative of the foreigner. He's just so amazed at the others who, who have no praise. They have no thankfulness back to God because, well, God, we expect you to do for us. We're not doing for you. We just think this is a one-way street and you just do for us. And so this is a very familiar parable. The lepers probably banded together because they're outcasts from the city. So 10 lepers one Samaritan, nine presumably then are Jewish. And so as you look at how it unfolds, he says, go show yourself to priest, something they would not be able to do unless they're clean, something they would have to do in order to get back into society because it is the priest that will pronounce them clean. And so go show yourself. And in great faith, they start on the journey while they still have leprosy. And so they do begin this. And so we're able to see how this happens. What a great thing as they begin and you can see the joy and the excitement that they would have as they've been cleansed. And the realization has hit, God is alive. God does great things. God is amazing. God is in my life. And then what's the next response? Well, it ought to be about giving glory to God. Jesus' question wasn't ten cleansed because Jesus expects praise from all the people who are cleansed. Jesus expects praise from every person who has been cleansed of any sin whatsoever. And if we claim to have forgiveness in Jesus Christ, He expects praise to come from that. Otherwise, we are like the others who simply take the blessing and run. Worship is an expected response to our cleansing. It's why we get together. It's why Mike learns all of these old songs and all of their history. And he's able to give us all of this input into what it means to sing this song. 
But how great is that to be able to worship God? And how great is that to sing with meaning? The worship isn't about us. It's about serving God. It's about having a master who's changed our life, who's forgiven our sins. And we can help other people change their life as we help them deal with their sin. So I saw this. One of the most challenging things I've ever seen. I have a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. Yeah, we could be the one that makes a difference in our life, in the lives of other people, in their relationship, in their helping deal with their sin, in their coming to Jesus Christ, in their thankfulness in their life. We can make real thankfulness, not just a day, but for all year. Because we could be the one to be forgiven of sin ourselves. And we can do that today. We can pray with you. We can baptize you into Christ that sin can be taken away. And we can be the one to help with someone else's sin. To help bring them to this. We could be the one to forgive them or their sin or take part in their forgiveness. The same way we would take part in the commission of a sin, we can take part in the forgiveness of a sin. We could be the one to have greater faith. We could be the mulberry tree shredder. You realize that? What a great thing that our little seed of faith could do so much. We could be the true servant of Jesus, the one who never quits, who realizes how much better it is to fix dinner for their master than it is to get the millstone and that we are thankful that all of those roots have been taken out of our life because God exalts the ones who humble themselves and who become the true servant. And we could be the one who praises God because of all that he does. And we have the real thanksgiving because we deal with the real problem. We've been healed of our disease, and we found glory in Jesus Christ, and we're not afraid to say it. So do you have this great forgiveness that comes in Jesus Christ? Then let's give praise for it. If not, come and let's deal with it. Shall we stand and sing? Yeah.